Okay, thank you, LAO. Thank you, Madam Chair, members, Meredith Worden with the LAO. Uh, we would note uh, that we continue to have concerns about uh, the risk of federal funding loss at Porterville and Fairview Developmental Centers. Uh, currently, federal funding is extended through June 3rd um, via the provide agreement that has been extended uh, several times over the last several months, um, during which uh, the administration has been in negotiation with the federal government um, in, in trying to uh, agree to terms to settle. Um, um, similar to the agreement that was uh, just terminated at Sonoma. And so the current May revise assumes that federal funding will continue. We would note that up to 66 million in federal funds could be lost should those settlement agreements uh, not come forward. Thank you. Thank you for that. Great news today. Appreciate, I appreciate that sobering reminder. Finance. Public comment. Madam Chair and members, Sue North with California Disability Services Association. Um, I find myself compelled to get up and say something because I think we've spent, I don't know how many hearings over the last three or four or five years on recurring problems at Sonoma. And I can't emphasize enough the need for this legislature to pay close attention to what's going on. Um, we, when the administration announced that they were going to close the DCs, Sonoma was put first on the list. And here we are two years, going on two years later and counting, and we still have problems like you're just addressing with this um, life-threatening, immediate jeopardy kind of situation. Um, the other two, Fairview and Porterville, my prediction will be, will be closed. The parts of them that need to be closed will be gone and Sonoma will still be having these conversations. I frankly don't know what the um, cure is, but if the state needs its own oversight overseer above the department, I frankly think you're, you need to consider what else needs to be done, because this is simply unacceptable. Those four units that the state chose not to decertify, I'd ask if there's still people living in them. And uh, is anyone looking at those units in all of this oversight? Because we've essentially wrote them off however many years ago, and the state taxpayers have picked up 100% of the cost of that over that cumulative period of time. It's very easy to get lost in the 11 to the 7 to the 4, and there are human beings still inside those places. And the history of what's happened to those um, patients residents is not a good one. So I just admonish everybody to think and cut through the cloud and the smoke and the fog here and get clear about what needs to happen to get Sonoma closed someday. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness. Madam Chair and members, Dwight Hanson on behalf of the Alliance. I'm, I was not going to get up on, on this issue, but um, I appreciate what you said, uh, Madam Chair, that you visited Sonoma and your view of it was something different than what you thought it was going to be. I've been doing this field for 20 years and we've been talking about closing, closing developmental centers for 20 years. We know the potential of life in the community is better. We know that now we have less than 1,000 people in the developmental centers whose quality of life would be better in the community. And yet we continue to have reason after reason after reason, and now we're at a crisis where the federal government has entirely lost confidence in the state of California to maintain safety, health and safety, let alone quality of life in its institutions. This is unconscionable, unconscionable, and I know that my colleagues and I have been in front of this committee for years now on this issue. What I would say to you now in terms of moving forward, and there's a long agenda to come, we will continue to discuss resources in the community, and you will continue to say, I think, that there's not enough resources. 
you'll hear about minimum wage increases and two times minimum wage and all of these other issues. We continue not to make investment in quality programming in the community and that slows this thing down in moving folks out. My colleagues with Support Living would be here saying that today. I just am absolutely appalled that we're going to look now at spending tens of millions of dollars backfilling an absolutely proven failed system and not have those same tens of millions of dollars to improve community supports. It just cannot continue this way and we can't allow more people to be hurt or to die in the developmental centers as a result. So I just ask you as we go through the rest of this agenda that when you get opportunities to make investments in the community to strengthen programs that we do so. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness. Hi. My name is Megan Gordon. I'm actually, I have a different perspective than many people here. I'm the chapter president for the psych techs at Sonoma Developmental Center. And I'm here, um, I, I came with our lobbyist, Kobe Pizzotti, and he gave me a couple things to read because he is at a, uh, he's a panelist on the Joint Senate and Assembly PERS hearing going on right now. So this concerns retention stipends for DC staff. We support and thank the department and administration for listening to our concerns for retention stipends for DC staff as an incentive to keep well-trained and seasoned staff at the developmental centers while they close. We agree this is something that is uh, appropriate for collective bargaining. We disagree with the agenda's proposal where a staff person must work the full quarter to receive the stipend. We don't think this will accomplish the goal of retaining staff. And um, making the retention bonus perceivable is something that would keep people longer. Number two, we support and appreciate the proposal for the community state staff crisis teams. We made this proposal during the closure public comment period, so we thank the committee for hearing our concerns. We believe this will help those individuals transitioning to the community tremendously, as well as individuals already living in the community that are in crisis. And level of care DC staffing reduction, we oppose this proposal as psych techs worked 110,847 hours of mandatory overtime in 2014. That number is only going to go up in the future as staff leave for more, more permanent positions. The department estimates it would need to hire 53 new positions to cover the overtime numbers. Um, and hiring po additional positions would cost about five million where uh, it makes no sense to eliminate these positions. There's a joint Senate and Assembly PERS hearing going on, and uh, that's where Kobe Pizzotti is right now. So thank you. Thank you very much. Next witness. Good morning, Catherine Blakemore, Disability Rights California. I think what we're trying to do is two things simultaneously, both of which are important. One, we have to ensure the quality remains intact for the people that live at Sonoma. And I would suggest one strategy is to develop and relook at a sort of a comprehensive quality assurance plan and want to offer Disability Rights California as one person that's happy to partner with the department to relook at how we're ensuring quality to make sure something's intact. I also know the State Council on Developmental Disabilities has staff on site, so that may be another resource to sort of look at how we step back, see what went awry, and what we collectively as a system might do differently to get better quality ongoing. The second is we also, as Ms. Bargeman said, have to redouble our efforts to ensure that we're, I, we're developing on time the placements that are promised for people to live in the community. We are actually behind schedule. We're only expecting about half the people that were intended to move this year to actually move. That doesn't bode well for sort of helping with those transitions. I think the staff of the committee did a commendable job of identifying some transparency measures for getting data about where we are posted on public websites, which I think is helpful. We've also discussed with the department and legislative staff some ideas we have about how to jumpstart that, although it would require an additional investment of funds. But we have to make sure we can develop the community at the same time we're improving the quality. So thank you. Thank you. Next witness. Tony Anderson, director of the ARC and United Cerebral Palsy. Um, good, good morning, Madam Chair. Um, you know, in reading through the analysis, I appreciate that that was so thorough, And uh, but the overview, the overall feeling, I think that you and others have said was uh, despair and anger, um, sadness that this continues to happen in the way it does. And, and I, I couldn't help but, but remember, uh, Madam Chair, your, your comments a couple of years ago when we were doing the confirmation for the Director uh, Rogers at the time, your warnings about 
uh, this particular problem continuing and was enough being done. And it just, it, it's continuing to happen. We want to do everything we can on our side. We want to close the developmental centers. Obviously, we've been telling you that for many years and you've been hearing that. But um, also what we've just heard about the, the individuals in there um, that we want, if you were to think of an individual with a developmental disability in the community and any of these things happening and what would we do as a response to that? And I would hope it would be very clear and immediate and everybody would know what had happened to the people who were responsible. We would, would, I'm just asking that we take the same approach and same perspective of our loved ones, the people we're representing that are in the developmental centers. Thank you. Thank you. Final witness. Aaron Carruthers, State Council on Developmental Disabilities for Brevity, want to attach myself to the comments uh, made from prior speakers other than the psych techs. Uh, nothing against the psych techs, it's just not the council's position. Um, uniquely want to state that the council has, I have staff in the institutions and in the community. We are in the unique role to make sure that each individual is uh, living with safety, uh, not their lives are not in jeopardy, and we're moving on to that better life out in the community. And we look forward to um, continuing in that role and making sure people move on and working with the department for a better outcome. Thank you very much. Seeing no further public comment. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Stone. Uh, Madam Chair, if we could, uh, just a, so a couple of follow-up questions based on some of the comments of the sure. uh, speakers. On the four units that we chose not to get recertification, um, was there federal funding attached to those four units and why do we not try to certify them and are there any patients left in those units? I can ask, answer a couple of those questions and then I'll, um, since I'm not as familiar with the, the issues back in 2012, I have to defer to uh, Mr. LaFon and see if he can answer that for you. Um, the four units actually have now been consolidated down to three. And so we do have um, 58 individuals that are presently residing on those three units. Um, regarding the history as to um, regarding the uh, relinquishing of the certification. Do you have some insight you can provide? Uh, no, the, the, when the, the certification was relinquished, there were no, that was all general fund. So those were all funded through general fund from uh, that time on. Um, and uh, the folks do continue to reside there though, again, as People have gone to placement. The uh, mixture of folks as they've downsized has combined uh, in consolidations and will continue to do so as we downsize. And what about safety concerns for those 58 people? Um, Even well, though we weren't getting federal funding, there were still some concerns, I presume, by the feds? We treat the, the care of all of the individuals at the center the same. And whether or not we have certification or not, we still aspire to the certification guidelines. And so we hold everyone to the same standard. And the QA department, um, all of the management follow up and ha have the same standard. There's no difference in how we provide care to whether they're certified or non-certified because we expect um, the care to be at the best level that we can have it to be. And we, whether, whether or not the federal government agrees with us or not, we're going to go for the certification standards because that's the, the best standard. Thank you. When you say that the 58, the population was combined, I don't know what that means. Um, as um, folks move into placement, you, uh, the numbers reduce on residences, and so at some point you actually have to consolidate residences down. And so some of the folks who were in the decertified units are now on some of the what would have been certified units. They're kind of mixed together now a little bit uh, more. But again, we just, we treat everyone the same way, so uh, we were tracking them person by person on whether or not they would receive FFP or not FFP. I can um, break down the population if that would be helpful for you. So um, in the intermediate care facilities that we're talking about that was originally the 11, um, because the original four um, had been consolidated down to three, um, essentially today it's actually 10 certified, it's 10 ICF units, if that um, kind of helps clarify that. Of those 10 units, those three have 58 individuals residing 
in those units. And then the 136 individuals um, would essentially be in the other seven units. And even though you're having to consolidate as, you, as people move into the community, um, there are certain needs that I would have as a resident that the ICF unit meets. And so, and so that still is your driving factor in terms of where I'm placed. Right. Okay. Anything else? All right, so I want to um, just read into the record and clarify um, what um, I'm going to ask that the motion be in terms of our actions today. And it will be that we adopt placeholder trailer bill language, not budget bill language, but trailer bill language. Um, and it's reflected uh, in the paragraph mid-page on page 30 of the uh, agenda. And it's recommended that the placeholder trailer bill language will require DSS to report the monthly general fund backfill costs as a result of the loss of FFP. Since this general fund backfill should go down as SDC residents transition into the community. So that will be the gist of the trailer bill language um, that will be drafted. I'll entertain a motion. So move. Please call the roll. Mitchell? Aye. Monning? Aye. Stone? Aye. Thank you very much. That's out with a three to zero vote. We'll move on now to issue two, uh, which is developmental center closures. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to just walk through the May revision proposals that are on page 31, and just for clarification, would you prefer that we do them individually, or would you prefer that I go through the entire list and then you can ask questions after that? Uh, let's do them individually and we can ask questions, Sounds good. if there are any. The first issue is uh, related to hiring an independent monitor for uh, the Fairview and Porterville settlement agreements, presuming that we will have uh, an agreement in place soon. As uh, Director Bargeman said, the, um, the funding for both Fairview and Porterville has been extended until June 2nd. We haven't heard from CMS that uh, the, these agreements are in jeopardy, so we expect to have agreements in place. The assumption is that they will require an independent monitor similar to the monitor that we have at Sonoma. The uh, projected cost for hiring this monitor is approximately 1.9 million, so that's what our request is. Any questions? Any questions, sir? Just sir, Monty. So the cost for a single monitor is 1.9 million? It has that broken down? This is for a contract with um, uh, an estimated contract. It, it's approximately a million dollars per center. It's, that's right in line with what we're paying now for the monitor that is at Sonoma. And does that translate into more than one individual who participates yes. in that? There's a number of individuals that go out and uh, review the work that's being done, uh, perform mock surveys, and to give us an assessment. That's, how, that's my question. It's not a single individual. It's a team Correct. that's doing this. Thank you. Let's go on to uh, number two. The next issue is a proposal that the department is putting forward to um, make it easier for developmental center employees to become uh, service vendors in the community if they so desire. Currently, the public contract code prohibits state employees from working uh, independently and, and working, providing services to the state. This language would allow that employees can remain 
as employees at the developmental centers until they are vendored by a regional center. The issue that we've heard expressed from our employees that they are interested in participating in such a program, but one of the drawbacks is that it can take up a year, up to a year to become vendored. So the lack of income makes it difficult for employees to uh, try to pursue that goal of becoming a vendor in the community. So this language attempts to address that. Let's go on to issue three. Uh, the next issue is um, uh, trailer bill language that's related to uh, the managed care provisions for individuals that are leaving the developmental centers. We're working with uh, the Department of Health Care Services on this language. We want to ensure that individuals transitioning from the developmental centers as they did at Ag News are able to get comprehensive services in the community. And we, we think this language will go a long way to doing that. The next item is um, it's provisional language that's being proposed for inclusion in our budget related to uh, the um, retention uh, incentives that are being proposed for developmental center employees. The, uh, there, there are funds that are made available in the um, uh, item 9800 item that is negotiated by uh, the California Department of Human Resources with the bargaining units. And um, we've proposed some ideas about uh, proposals that may work to um, ensure employees stay on through closure of the developmental centers, but the details of those agreements have to be bargained. Senator Stone. You okay? Okay, so we can go on to uh, questions two, three, and four on page 35. Thank you. Um, question two, the, one of the, the items on, on this particular question was related to the tracking the closure of Sonoma by December 2018. And as noted that we are um, behind on our projected numbers for transitions from the developmental centers to the community this year. Um, when we looked at the projected number of 202, that was statewide. Um, and as of um, May, we had um, 118 individuals transition to the community and we have another um, we're going to project we're projecting by June 30th that we're going to have a total of 150 of the 202 um, so that's specific to statewide not specific to Sonoma um, regarding Sonoma as far as being able to track it um, I really do focus a lot on where we are in the development of resources we had as I mentioned earlier that we have the community plan um, resources that were approved for Sonoma specifically that's been in it, um, uh, an infusion of funds that's been very, very helpful to the regional centers. Um, as such, there's 112 residential facilities um, that have been identified for development. Those um, development um, activities would yield a capacity of 438. So when we take a look at the current population at Sonoma of 352, um, we do have a projected number that will be exceeding that to, to allow for choice. Um, based on the projections that we're gonna have, we we know that we're behind this year. We do anticipate being able to um, um, increase and be able to expedite the development this next year and we'll be able to provide a breakdown, I don't have that today, as to what those projected um, development um, schedules are, um, but we can certainly do that in short order. The next, I'm sorry, the next item was um, as far as the risk um, if the department regional centers do not meet this deadline. You know, when we take a look at the transition of folks from developmental centers, at the very end of any closure, there's there's some issues that we identify as risks that we have to continue to pay attention to. As we already mentioned, we do have some units that have already started to do some consolidations. As we get closer to the end of closure, um, any delays, we have to continue to monitor how we're doing the transition of staff. So making sure that we have adequate staffing, making sure that we have the staff that are there to provide that level of care that's necessary. Also the consolidated, uh, consolidation of units, that presents changes of relationships. So we have to be very mindful of that. So as um, 
things happen if we are delayed, those are some areas that are going to be presented as risk that we wanna make sure that we're aware of. The other, of course, is um, the extension of the increase of general fund that would be impacted to the fact that if we were not able to achieve the closure date. The last item was given, um, oh, I think that's, yeah, given the um, DCERT action at Sonoma would um, DDS prioritize the transition? We had um, briefly talked about that. I can certainly expand more if you would like me to. That's fine. Let's move on to questions three and four. <laughs> okay, for um, issue three. Um, how is the department ensuring regional centers are on track? Again, I had um, provided you some over, an overview of how we're working with the regional centers and what we've done recently to increase that oversight. So with the monthly calls that we have with the regional centers and also with the um, uh, developmental centers and with, um, um, with our department, we make sure that we're tracking by development as well as by individual so we can have a tracking of where everybody is in the process and then increasing our um, meetings with the regional center directors on a monthly basis. Um, these are some of the areas that we're doing to ensure that they are achieving it. The other is making sure that we're responsive to um, if there's concerns or challenges that they're facing that we can also be responsive to get um, support to them um, to help them to achieve their targets. Are there consequences uh, if the regional centers don't meet the targets? You know, in prior community placement plan, we did have um, a consequence, so to speak, um, if regional centers did not achieve their targeted placement goals um, under their operations in CPP, we withheld 25% of their operations dollars. Now that's been under the regular supports for CPP historically. Um, one of the concerns in doing so going forward is that by withholding any operations supports, that means that that doesn't really help us achieve what's needed because we may need to make sure we have the operations for the regional centers to have the resources, the staffing resources to achieve the goals. So we're approaching it not so much on say, taking a look at how can we have um, penalties or anything that would be associated it, with it, but looking at how can we provide the supports and make sure that we're responsive as a department also to some of the challenges that they're facing that's causing those delays. And number four. And then on four, um, working with um, the Cal Health Facilities Financing Authority, um, CHAF is also what it's referred to. Um, we had our community services division recently and in the last few months that has had a couple of conversations regarding um, some of the funding that is available for long-term financing. Um, while there's some um, parameters within the funding that is um, not helping the um, nonprofit housing foundations, that the match, you know, as far as being able to make that work isn't really looking like something that we're gonna be able to move forward with as it's structured today. We're extremely appreciative of the the efforts that um, Chaffa has allowed in this dialogue um, under this particular grant program. We also know that there's a proposal that's in for DRC and um, Regional Center of East Bay that's been submitted. That's a separate issue. Um, it's not related to the conversations that we've had as a department with Chaffa. Any questions, colleagues? Uh, LAO. Finance. Michelle Baca, Department of Finance. Um, we are opposed to the proposed funding augmentation um, that's in your uh, rest staff recommendation um, as it is not consistent with the governor's May revision proposal. Thank you. Public comment. Madam Chair, uh, Senator Monning, Senator Stone, distinguished staff, uh, Rick Rollins here on behalf of ARCA, Association of Regional Center Agencies. Uh, ARCA, uh, we have submitted a, a comprehensive letter to your committee on uh, all the issues uh, before you today in the May revise, but I'd like to uh, make the, the following comment. Uh, ARCA remains committed to working with families and uh, Department of Developmental Services to continue to meet former developmental center residents need in community settings. ARCA supports the proposed increases in funding for resource development and regional center staff to achieve this. ARCA also supports the proposed trailer bill language and funding to help developmental center staff continue to serve current and former developmental center residents and the proposal to allow access 
to loans to build housing needed to transition individuals out of developmental centers. ARCA, ARCA believes that changes to the restraint usage and reporting is more appropriately uh, done through a policy bill uh, so that all the impacts uh, of these changes can be fully explored and understood. Thank you very much. Good morning, Tony Anderson, the ARC and United Cerebral Palsy. Uh, we're not going to oppose the proposal for the state staff to um, to become vendorized, although what we would say is that we would offer that it's not exactly the same job and that we would expect there be some provisions in place for the differences in community services. And then the other piece is that we really feel strong that this is a person-centered system. We wanna make sure that people, that there are protections in place so that people are not forced into going into uh, any particular uh, settings with somebody who they may or may not uh, want supporting them. We, we just need protections in place for there. Didn't see any of that language and we're assuming that would be there, but we couldn't let that go without uh, expressing that people choose uh, who will support them in, in the community. So, thank you. Madam Chair and members, Maria Garcia with Greenberg Torig on behalf of the Parent Hospital Association. We wanna uh, thank the legislature and the department for continuing uh, to work with us on facilitated meetings, both with PHA, the county, and several other stakeholders to ensure a safe transition of residents out of uh, Sonoma Developmental Center into the community. Uh, we do absolutely support the proposal in the May revise for trailer bill language, um, allowing uh, DC staff to become vendorized in the community. Um, and while we appreciate the efforts at staff retention uh, through closure, uh, we and, and understand that a lot of it is gonna be subject to collective bargaining, we believe that the proposal and the analysis doesn't go far enough, and, and specifically far enough in creating the incentives for staff to stay, knowing that in closure is it, uh, that closure of the facility is impending, and so one of the bigger incentives we'd like the department and the legislature to consider is making any financial incentive for retention to be what's, you know, perceivable, so that the salary that they're garnering could be uh, contributed to uh, their, their retirement compensation. Uh, also, uh, we want to thank the committee for their recommendations on the community state staffing program. We think that's absolutely essential and something not included in the May revised suggestion. Uh, we do believe that in addition to the community state staffing program that there needs to be incentives for providers to actually hire the state staff. Um, there are, are, are difference, uh, differences in the ability of uh, providers to actually be incentivized to take on a state staff even when the cost is neutral. Um, and again, we uh, support the committee's recommendation um, for a plan um, on crisis centers and access. That's a, a key effort for us in ensuring the safe transition of those residents who will not have an initial uh, success in community placements and having somewhere for them to go. Thank you.